please make sure the loan repayment is handled. While I was busy at work, an unexpected email suddenly appeared. I immediately contacted Bruce, who started explaining calmly. Oh, sorry about that, he said. I've fallen for someone else and have decided to start a new life with her. He also disclosed his intention to take the luxury car that was recently purchased under my name with a loan. Despite my attempts to talk him out of it, my husband ignored my pleas, abruptly ended our conversation, and became unreachable. Eventually, Bruce vanished with his new partner, leaving behind a considerable amount of debt for me. As the mother of our nine-year-old son, I was stunned by this unfair turn of events. At 38 years old, my name is Tiffany, and my husband Bruce, who is of the same age, left our family, which includes our bright son Russell. Russell has always shown exceptional intelligence, engaging with academic articles, and discussing complex issues from a young age. On the other hand, Bruce was never stable, struggling to keep a steady job. Despite my steady full-time employment and our future plans, Bruce had only recently maintained a stable income for about four years. Bruce had often talked about making lasting memories together as a family, which led us to decide to purchase a $110,000 camper van. However, Bruce failed to meet the finance company's requirements for a loan, so I had to take it out in my name. On the day the camper van was delivered, I received a shocking email from Bruce stating he would take the van since the loan was in my name and that I would be responsible for the repayments. Confused, I called him immediately, only to hear him confess that he had fallen in love with another woman and decided to pursue a relationship with her. I thought it was just a fleeting thing, but it turned serious, so I'm planning to start a new life with her, he said and mentioned the divorce papers that we had argued about before. He stated his intention to file them and abruptly ended the call. This conversation was the first time I realized the depth of Bruce's betrayal, a truly shocking moment. All my subsequent attempts to contact him were fruitless, and I was left to face this harsh new reality alone. When I returned home from work and went to check the drawer where the divorce papers should have been, I found it empty. The papers were gone, and I was left grappling with the huge debt from a 100 and $10,000 car loan. Despite my countless attempts to contact my husband through emails and calls, he never responded. My son Russell, noticing that I was acting differently, approached me with concern after dinner. Mom, what's wrong? You haven't been eating much lately. Are you okay? He asked gently. Ah, yeah, maybe I'm just tired, I replied trying to hide my distress. When people lie, they look up to the right. Lying is bad. Dad hasn't been home for five days. Did something happen between you two? Russell's acute observation startled me, and I took a deep breath, trying to calm myself. Feeling that I could no longer conceal the truth, I decided to share everything with him. It's just something your dad would do. I admitted unsure how to express my sadness. Aren't you sad? he asked. No, I kind of understood from how things were going, Russell replied, his tone detached as if he had foreseen the events. Although he seemed unfazed by the prospect of our family separation, I knew deep down it had to affect him. Silently apologizing to Russell in my thoughts, I tried desperately to distract myself from the turmoil Yet my body betrayed my emotional strain, and my health began to decline. There was a training session at work that day, but I couldn't stand up. Sorry, I can't stand right now. I need to take a break, I managed to say before collapsing. When I regained consciousness, I found myself in a hospital room. The doctor informed me that I needed detailed examinations and admitted me for further observation. Lying there, staring at the IV drip and the hospital's white ceiling, tears began to flow freely. Just then, Russell burst into the room, his face etched with worry. 
Seeing him so distressed, I quickly wiped my tears. Mom, what happened? Is it serious? You're not going to die, right? His voice trembled with fear. Of course not. I wouldn't leave my dear son alone. I reassured him, my voice soft but firm. That's good. I was so scared when the school teacher called to say you were taken to the hospital. Russell admitted, his relief palpable. Seeing his concern, I realized just how much Russell was affected by everything happening around us, and it strengthened my resolve to handle our challenges more openly with him. The shock was so intense that it felt like my heart might stop. Russell, despite being mature beyond his years, was still just a nine-year-old boy. His concern spurred a strong resolve in me to recover, but my health was deteriorating faster than I expected. After a thorough checkup, the doctors diagnosed me with a serious illness and recommended immediate surgery. Following their advice, I underwent the procedure. A month had passed since Bruce left. By the time I was discharged from the hospital, returning home, I opened the mailbox only to find a demand letter for the car loan payment. I had assumed these payments were being automatically deducted from my account. Panicking, I checked my account balance with my cash card. Shockingly, what was once $42,000 had dwindled to just $54. I thought to myself, Bruce did this. I want to ask him to return the money, but I can't reach him. What should I do? Without the camper van, selling it to recover the funds wasn't an option. As I sank deeper into despair over these misfortunes, Russell noticed my distress. He placed his hand on my forehead and asked, You look pale. Are you feeling sick again? You don't seem to have a fever, though. I'm physically fine, but your father took not only the car, but all the money we had saved. I can't work due to my condition, and now we have no money, I explained, feeling overwhelmed. Seeing my predicament, Russell's face lit up with determination. I see. Then I'll deliver newspapers and search the internet to see if there's any work I can do, he declared. His spirit and resolve encouraged me. It's not the time to be down. I told myself, feeling a renewed sense of purpose. Sorry for worrying you. I can't afford to be weak. I'll change my mindset and try to do whatever I can, I said, managing a smile for him. Russell smiled back and then suggested something unexpected. Let's plan how to get the car back from Dad. How can we do that? The camper van is in your name, right? He asked. Yes, but what about it? Then maybe we can. Russell began suggesting an idea I hadn't even considered, something completely out of the box. I was stunned. Also, I have no idea where your father is. I admitted, the reality of our situation settling in. Despite the challenges, Russell's creative thinking and proactive attitude gave me hope that perhaps there was a way to navigate through this crisis. So let's check my phone, I suggested, remembering how a month ago, when we went hiking as a family, Russell felt a bit disoriented. Surprisingly, the usually reliable Russell had felt lost during that hike. Based on that experience, we bought him a child cell phone and installed a GPS app on it, which both Bruce and I could access. With this app, I can see where Dad is in real time, and he's been moving around a lot. Oh, is that so? But what if we find him and he just gives us a vague answer and escapes again? I mused, trying to think ahead. Don't worry, Russell smiled, revealing a hint of a plan. I've already taken precautions. What did you just say? I was taken aback by his initiative. To my amazement, Russell had independently taken action while I was in the hospital, something truly astonishing. I can't believe such a clever child is mine, I thought, impressed by his foresight and resourcefulness. He had even kept tabs on Bruce's whereabouts, including his movements with his mistress. 
All right, let's teach Dad a lesson for betraying us, I agreed, bolstered by Russell's confidence. Okay, let's start the plan right away, I responded, and together we prepared for what was to come. With Russell by my side, I felt unstoppable. Bring it on, anywhere, anytime, I thought to myself. Five days later, my phone rang. Ah, it's me. Please, I need your help. Who might this be? I played along, even though I knew the voice all too well. Don't play dumb. It's your husband. I'm being questioned by the police because of you. At this rate, they might ask me to come to the police station voluntarily. Help me out. Oh, is that so? Just wait a moment then, I replied, maintaining my composure. I immediately went with Russell to the location Bruce had mentioned. To my surprise, it was a forest park near our house, a popular camping spot. There Bruce was being questioned by the police in front of his car, looking utterly bewildered. I felt a mix of pity and resolve. I approached the police. We need to talk about a couple. Could you please give us a moment? I asked, and they stepped away. Inside the car, Bruce's mistress sat cross-legged, glaring at us, but her presence no longer mattered. Sorry about that. Thanks for coming. But why did the police suddenly show up at my place? I don't get it, Bruce stammered, confused. That's because I filed a report about the missing camper van, I explained calmly. What? Why would you do that? He asked, bewildered. It's obvious, isn't it? My car was stolen, I stated matter-of-factly. Bruce, foolishly thinking that actions between spouses couldn't be criminal, began to utter nonsensical excuses. But the world isn't that naive. You know you filed for divorce, remember? So we're practically strangers now. And driving a stranger's car without permission is a crime, I explained, as Russell had cleverly figured out. Russell, typical for his sharp mind even at a young age, had pieced everything together. But I didn't steal the car, I just borrowed it for a bit. Bruce protested weakly. Oh, is that so? Well, I'd like to use my car now, so could you return it? That would be helpful, I said, extending my hand for the keys. Bruce, though reluctant, handed them over after a moment. With the keys safely in my possession, Russell, who had been quiet up until now, began to question his father. Hey, why did you abandon your family and choose to run off with her? He asked, his voice steady but curious. Caught off guard by his son's blunt question, Bruce was visibly flustered and awkwardly scratched his head. This prompted Bruce's mistress to chuckle smugly and interject. It's because I'm more attractive than your mother. Look at me, you can see it, right? He fell head over heels for me and decided to leave his family. Quiet. I didn't ask you, old lady. Dad, you answer, Russell commanded with a stern tone. Julia was silenced by Russell's firm directive, but Bruce remained silent. If you can't explain, that's fine. I'll just have the police come back and take you. I threatened, seeing his hesitation. Wait, hold on. Okay, I'll talk, Bruce finally conceded. Julia, it turns out, joined Bruce's company two months ago. They were attracted to each other and became involved at the welcome party for new employees. Later, it was discovered that Julia was pregnant, and Bruce decided to start a new life with her, leaving us behind. Why did you take the camper van? I pressed on. I quit my job and thought about selling the car for money, but it seems like you were using it quite a bit, weren't you? I thought it was a waste to sell it right away, so we decided to go on a trip, Bruce explained. Wait, how do you know all this? He asked, puzzled. Remember when Russell got lost? After that, as a precaution, we bought him a kid's cell phone and installed a GPS app. Did you forget? We installed it on your phone too, so I knew where you were all this time, I revealed. 
By the way, I later found out from Russell that he had pretended to get lost during our family hike, a clever move that helped us prepare for any future uncertainties. I was stunned by Russell's ability to think ahead at his strategic actions. I suspected something was off with Dad, so I came up with this plan to monitor his actions. He explained with a calm that belied his age. You are a formidable child, I remarked, half joking, half serious. I hope never to become an adult like Dad, who betrays important people without a second thought. Bruce, faced with the harsh reality Russell presented, looked pitiful and was unable to offer any defense. In contrast, seeing Russell, only nine but speaking and thinking with such clarity and firmness, gave me a profound sense of strength and resolve as a mother. I felt I couldn't back down, especially when it came to settling things properly. Also, return the $42,000 you withdrew from my account right now. That was our joint property as a couple, I demanded. I don't have to return it, Bruce retorted stubbornly. No, it's not like that. The money was what I saved bit by bit since I was single. After all, you always quit your jobs midway, so we hardly ever saved money together, did we? I countered my voice firm. Hearing that the $42,000 had been squandered by Bruce and his mistress was appalling, but it also made me feel relieved about the decision to divorce him. That's how it is. But if you've stolen and used the car and my money, that's going to be a serious crime, I continued. What? I just sent the police away, so it's not their business anymore, right? Bruce tried to dismiss the issue. I only said we would talk. I have no intention of withdrawing the complaint. I must add the theft of my money to the report. I asserted, Russell, should I call the police now? I can do it with just one button on my phone. Julia Bruce's mistress had been silently observing our conversation, but quickly tried to exit the camper van. At that moment, she let out a scream that echoed around us. The reason was startling. Outside the car door, Julia's parents stood, their faces red with anger, ready to explode in fury. Startled, she stepped back as her parents began to yell at her. Ah, I'm sorry. Don't be so angry. But why are you here, Mom and Dad? I called your parents beforehand. I revealed, watching the scene unfold. What? Why? Julia stammered, taking it all in. The truth was during my hospital stay, Russell had visited Bruce's office and tearfully told Julia's parents. My dad left the house with another woman. This preemptive move by Russell had brought everything to this pivotal moment, turning the tables on Bruce and Julia dramatically. In the wake of Russell's visible distress and frail demeanor, the staff at Bruce's office had grown suspicious of Julia who had recently departed the company alongside Bruce. They had noticed the pair being overly friendly and even shared photos of them looking cozy at the welcome party for new employees. Learning from her colleagues that Julia still commuted from her parents' home, Russell managed to obtain her parents' address. With this information, Russell and I visited her parents, armed with a photo of Julia. When we met them, I explained everything that had transpired. Thus today, after contacting Julia's parents again, I asked them to stay nearby for a while, ready to confront their daughter. How could you do this to me? Julia exclaimed, her face a mix of shock and betrayal. I don't want to hear that from you. That's my line, I retorted. Then noticing her pronounced belly, I couldn't help but ask. By the way, your stomach seems quite big. What does the baby do? In two months, she replied, flustered. Wait a minute, that doesn't add up. You and my husband met only two months ago. What's going on? The timeline was off, and everyone sensed it. This was the first time Bruce heard of the due date, and he stared at Julia with wide eyes. Wait, what does that mean? Are you stupid? Don't you get it? 
It takes about eight months from conception to birth, which means the child she's carrying isn't yours. You're so foolish, I pointed out, the realization dawning on him. Julia, now cornered, retorted, What do you mean? Have you been deceived? Oh, I almost got away with it. She confessed with a scoff, her demeanor shifting to resignation. Can't help it now that I'm caught. You're so naive. You can't see through lies at all. A fool. Don't mock me. My whole life is ruined because of you. What were you thinking? Bruce blurted out, his frustration boiling over. Bruce and Julia then started a heated argument, but no one intervened, allowing them to air out their grievances. Meanwhile, we contacted the police again to update them on the situation. As dusk turned to night, the area was illuminated by the red lights of police cars approaching the scene. No, really, I was wrong. I'm truly sorry. I'll work hard and never cheat again, so please just don't arrest me, Bruce pleaded, desperation in his voice. People don't change that easily, especially lazy people like you. Russell chimed in, wise beyond his years. Exactly, Russell's right. I can't trust you, I affirmed, standing firm in the chaotic unraveling of truths. Reflecting on the situation, I firmly told Bruce, think about your actions and prepare to face the consequences at the police station. If I get arrested, I won't be able to pay back the money. Is that okay with you? Bruce pleaded, looking for any leverage to avoid accountability. I don't mind. Pay me back after you've served your time for your crimes. Take your time, don't worry. I've already found you a job. I responded calmly, outlining a clear path forward for restitution. Let's see, there's Russell's child support, plus the $2,000 you owe me. I'm not sure how much it will all add up to, but you'll work and pay it all back, I declared. Turning to Julia, the mistress, I had one last thing to say. You might think you're just an observer here, but don't forget you're an accomplice to Bruce's theft. Be prepared for the consequences. When I mentioned that Julia would have to pay if Bruce couldn't return the stolen money, she shivered with fear. Julia sought help from her parents, but they sternly refused, declaring, we disown a daughter who causes trouble for others. Thus, Bruce and Julia were taken away in a police car thanks to the smart strategy devised by Russell. Although they were released from detention soon after, they faced a substantial financial obligation to me. Through a lawyer, I claimed $42,000 in damages. Additionally, I secured an agreement from Bruce to pay $1,000 a month in child support for Russell. I also introduced Bruce to a subcontracting factory associated with the company I work for. The support payments and other charges I claimed from Bruce would be deducted directly from his salary and deposited into my account. Furthermore, I sold the camper van, liberating myself from the associated auto loan. Since these changes, my health has improved remarkably. I am now more energetic and committed to my job than ever. Russell, too, has been actively helping with household chores and errands. We are both committed to moving forward strongly so that Russell can pursue whatever path he loves without any hindrances.